We're talking today with Nicholas Selecki of Flushing, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Nick, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in October 1990 in Flint, Michigan. Okay. Did you grow up in Flint? I did. I grew up, well, outside of Flint, yeah, suburb sure. Flushing. Okay. Uh, what high school did you go to? Flushing Senior High. Okay. Uh, and what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? My mom is a barber, and my dad works for General Motors. I think at their World Supply Headquarters. Okay. So there still is some GM in Flint? There's some. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then uh, when did you graduate from high school? 2009 in the early summer. Okay. Uh, and you were kind of young then, but what do you remember about 9-11? 9-11, I remember I was in elementary school. Um, I think it was fifth or sixth grade, about. And... We were in class, they came over, they sent us all home, nobody knew why. We got home, where everybody was hovering around TVs at that time, and saw a plane flying into a building. And from there, was where most people remember just the news, newsreels updating the next plane flying into the towers, being, I think I was around 11 at the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know much about what was going on. Okay, and then after that, we have wars that start up in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And as you got a little older, did you pay attention to those? Yeah. Oh yeah, um, my high school had quite a few guys that would go and join the Army or the Marine Corps, and they would go over. Uh, we had a few guys that were in Fallujah, I want to say in 2004, but I'm not quite sure. Would if have that been was the when first the first time. big ugly fight was, yeah. Yeah, the first was known a few guys that graduated two years ahead of me. They were in Fallujah, number two, mm -hmm. and uh, Operation Phantom Fury and all the follow-on operations. So we heard about it, we were watching it, and I mean, a lot of young guys and my friends, we all, I joined with six of my best friends, mm -hmm. and we all wanted to, to fight, we wanted to get out there, I mean, being a young testosterone filled guy, we're like, yeah, let's go kick some ass. So at what point along the line did, did you and your friends decide you were going to go in? Um, probably at the end of football season, my senior year of high school. Okay. Um, I was serious into football, but that was that was around my life in high school. Mm -hmm. I mean, most 18-year-old guys that care about sports and having a good time. And about that point, I realized my my brother was in university at the time mm -hmm. in Flint at Kettering University, and he had an outstanding student debt. And after listening to my parents and him and all them go on about the cost of school and how that tuition is hurting our family, I didn't know what I wanted to go to school for. And I knew that if I went, it was going to be expensive mm -hmm. and to party and have a good time probably wasn't a good idea and all this developed later on into more detailed and logical planning but at that point that was my logic like it's expensive don't want that so and I've looked at the military as an option okay and so then uh, why the Marine Corps all my buddies were joining the Marine Corps um, we had one family friend he went to West Point he was an officer in the army and other than him I'd never heard much good about the army I wanted to do some actual fighting I didn't want to sit in the rear mm -hmm. And my buddies were saying, hey, you know, we're going to talk to a Marine recruiter. Two of them had already signed up, so I went mm -hmm. and sat down with them. And uh, What kinds of things does the recruiter tell you? Actually, he doesn't tell you anything to start. He asks you, what do you want to do? He asks okay. you why you want to join. And they had, I think, like 11 different um, squares. And it turns out the Marine Corps calls them leadership traits, or J.J. did tie buckle. And you would say what you wanted, and he would lay any of these out, and he'd say, pick three or four of these out things that mean something to you, and then he would base the conversation off the things you pick out and how the Marine Corps can develop that or what it can give you. I remember I said I wanted to join the Marine Corps to help get the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. um, that was an incentive. It would pay for school, but then also I wanted to see the world. I didn't know what I wanted to do. It gives you four years of time mm -hmm. to kind of figure all this out while building yourself. So he said, you know, I can get your job as an armorer. And for a while I was interested in it, and then later on I made him pretty angry because he got a they had three contracts in the nation for this high-level armor position. And okay. I was like, nah, nah, I'm going to go for the infantry. <laughs> and he, he threw up a pen. He was like, really? He was infantry. Mm -hmm. He was a mortarman. And he kind of looked at me like, I gave you this best contract. He threw it away. I was like, nah, I'm going to go infantry. I'm going to go fight. All right. So at that point, one of the things, well, well you had it in the sense that you, you, you wanted to, to go and fight. Hand, working with weapons was good enough or you took the armor or thing, or did he make it sound like a really good thing to do? Or He made it sound like a really good thing because I was interested in guns. I mean, mm -hmm. I, from where I was at in my town, a lot of guys were. And I thought originally that would be fun. 
but then I ended up pulling away from that because I thought, you know, I don't want to sit in this jail cell of a dungeon working on guns all day. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to learn much other than the technical trade of that gun. I can learn how to work a gun and handle guns in the infantry, so that to me was a win. Yeah. And I could also get out. I could learn leadership. I could interact with people and be on the news or something. Because mm -hmm. yeah. you can hear about people who get a very specialized skill in the military that doesn't transfer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when do you have to report for duty for training then? I had to go to boot camp in August 2009. I want to say I left on August 2nd. Okay. I might be wrong, but I think that was the day. Okay. And so did you, do you get your... And where do they train you? Um, we go to San Diego. Mm -hmm. And how do you get out there? They fly you. you. Well, first you go to Lansing, Michigan, because every recruiting station mm -hmm. has a place where they do the evaluations, the right. physicals. They centralize all their pulleys for that month or for that loading. And they send you to the airport. And all of you pulleys are on a plane. You don't have any Marines with you. You fly to Detroit for your link up. And you have a phone number, so if like, your flight gets canceled, you miss the flight, so you call that number, then mm -hmm. they react accordingly. They fly you to San Diego on a long flight, probably the longest flight of your life. At you're, that point. Yeah, I mean, you're flying to California, it's already a long flight, but you got all that suspense, everything building up. You land in San Diego, and it's usually about 10 o'clock at night-ish. If it's earlier, you sit in the USO for a few hours, and everybody at the San Diego airport or the USO and all mm -hmm. the staff, they know exactly why you're there. Yeah. This happens every month. Mm -hmm. So you sit down at the USO, and eventually a Marine walks in. He looks like a drill instructor, but he has the hard hat, the drill instructor hat. Mm -hmm. He comes in, he yells, everybody's motivated. They jump up, they run outside, and you're getting on a bus to go to the Yellow Footprints. All right. Uh, now, the bus ride itself, do they say anything to you, or do they leave you to No talking. Out? You put your heads down. They tell you, put your head down, no talking. Anybody talks, they start screaming at them. But your whole point is supposed to put your head down and pretty sure the idea is to to discombobulate you, to confuse you. So they, they drive you through San Diego, you're on the airport, but if you're not from there, you don't know where you're at. Mm -hmm. And when you're keeping your head down, you can't talk to the person next to you, it's just, just building. They're building this environment, and they control every aspect of it. Yeah. Isn't the depot actually fairly close to the airport? It's very close to the airport. Yeah. I, have, I have a suspicion, I can't prove it. I have a few buddies, they're drone instructors, they kind of laughed when I asked them. They said that that the, the bus might drive you around the block a few times and then pull you in just to help build that connection. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard that one before. So, okay, you get there, so it's the middle of the night, you get off the, you have your head down, uh, bus pulls in into the recruiting depot, now what happens? The drone instructor gets on the bus and he tells you all eyes on him. He gives you some very basic instructions where you're going to get out, you're going to get out into these yellow footprints, and they're infamous. Everybody know. I think anybody who's ever heard of the Marine Corps at some point has heard of the yellow footprints. At that point, there's six drone structures out there waiting to unleash all hell on you. And everybody's getting on these footprints. You're standing your attention. And for probably the next six hours, you're doing basic admin things. From there, it's like an assembly line. Your head gets... Well, first, you walk into a room. And you have to get all your pockets. You take off all personal items. So you're just in basic clothes and shoes. And then you go get your hair cut, where they give you the worst haircut of your life. These barbers are just told, like, give them the shittiest buzz job. Ever. And then plus your head, you have patches coming out, you look like a cancer patient. It's horrible. But anyway, then you go to the next step, and that's where you receive your basic gear, like your first set of camis, your some some shoes, because you don't wear boots for the first week. They, they call them go fasters. They come up with a name for everything to reinvent the wheel. It's tennis shoes. Mm -hmm. You put on your tennis shoes, and you look ridiculous, because you, you don't have any form to your hat. You're wearing wrinkled, right-out-of-the-box camis, tennis shoes with them that are blue, and you're up for 24 hours, and the reason they do that is to reset your body clock. I mean, you're going non-stop, so you don't really notice, but probably about 7 a.m. when you're walking outside, you're like, hey, the sun's coming up, and you're, you're marching to get your first meal on the depot. And actually, when I was marching, my first meal, my buddy, my best friend, he was already in boot camp a month and a half. I saw him. He saw me. I was coming in, and he saw me receiving. He gave me the finger just to give him <laughs> for some fun. And I got my first meal, and then that was probably the only time we saw each other. No, we saw each other one more time after that. And my his last week, I was somewhere in the middle of training. There was a, a laundry room, and we met mm -hmm. up in there. It was like, It's like prison. There's a little system that works out and recruits talk to each other, and the one place where all of these companies meet is the laundry center. So that, that that's the start of boot camp, and mm -hmm. 
from there it was just 13 weeks of all out hell and training. Okay, I'm going to back up a little bit. You, you get a physical when you go in. Do, do, do they process a bunch of people at the same time? Oh yeah. Okay, and how how rigorous was the physical? Um, well, for the first physical that you do, the basic elimination rounds. That's that's here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. They're local. I think yeah. it's called MEPS. And that's just like going to a doctor to get a physical as an athlete. Right. They make sure you don't have hernias and make sure you have basic range of motions and no flat feet. Once you get to the depot, all that stuff's kind of taken care of. They assume that if you're there, mm -hmm. you meet these basic requirements. Right. And anybody who falls out after that, either something comes to light that they didn't, couldn't catch, or you just push on through it. Mm -hmm. They didn't catch my flat feet. I kind of hid my flat feet. And... I was fine. Yeah, I mean, if you're able to do all the marching and whatever. But the thing with that physical, they don't really go into depth on the inside. You give a copy of your medical records from mm -hmm. your doctor when you want to enlist. Yeah. And if you don't have anything in that medical record, it doesn't go through. Okay. My last, this is fast forward a little bit, my last week of boot camp, we were in the Crucible. And I was a squad leader all through boot camp, and there's one person and one recruit hired me, and that was the platoon guide. He had a heart condition he never told him about. And we found out about it because when we were in a boxing ring, he got punched in the heart. And his heart stopped, and he had to get air evac'd out. Turns out it wasn't his medical record. It was a pre-existing condition. He was separated from the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So it can happen. Didn't even make it to be a Marine. It was already right. separated. Now, uh, what are, I mean, after that first week of processing and so forth, once they give you actual boots and start the regular training, what do they do in that first, like, seven weeks or whatever that is? Well, it's divided into three phases. Phase one is basically they're building discipline. They're breaking you down, and that's the whole idea of phase one, break you down. Physically, they're running you into the ground. They're making you exhausted. They're beating drill into you. They're not literally beating you, but sometimes you would think they are. Um, it's mostly physical conditioning, and the early stages are the basis for the next two phases. The second phase after drill, which would probably be week four, or no, week five through eight, that's when they're starting to develop um, the, the basic uh, sense of being a Marine. Because they break you down and the whole reason is to build you back up and mold you mm -hmm. into the way they want. I mean, some things stay the same from day one when you're in the bathroom, whenever you're done using the bathroom, which is everything's on a timeline, you get on the wall and you're, you're in a line. And then they tell you to recite some acronym. We love acronyms. Mm -hmm. And you just yell this word and you know what to yell after it and you do it so many times, repetitions. You, it's, it's ingrained in you mm -hmm. to this day. BAMSIS. It's an acronym we know for beginning for the six stages of issuing a order and planning. Beaten into me. I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. And they do this through boot camp, but as time goes on, you build on it. There's more acronyms. There's more things to learn. Second phase, you go up north to Camp Pendleton to mm -hmm. the recruit center there. That's where you do your basic rifle qualifications. You will do the very basic like fire team movements and get that concept of a fire team and for most marines that don't go infantry outside of that or the combat training that's all they're going to have mm -hmm. for the infantry that is like crawling phase right. that's just beginning okay so you do that part in common uh, and i guess how much of this were you expecting when you went in they give you a good idea they prep you a lot the marines they, they don't just send you there to fail i mean one, one thing I like to think that separates from the Army is we believe in excellence. We believe in a brilliance in the basics. It's written on the sign to SOI, or the School of Infantry. And uh, they want to give you this rough understanding, this rough knowledge. They want to prepare you the best they can mm -hmm. or the best they're allowed to in that situation for boot camp because they can't give away the secrets of the trade. Mm -hmm. But they want to prepare you because they want you to succeed. They want you to pass because every Marine that doesn't pass, that's an empty boat slot. That's a waste of tax dollars. That's just a waste of time. Mm -hmm. So they want to build you up to be the best you can be and then anybody who elevates above that is kind of like uh, Darwinism. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so you had some sense of what was going on and why it was happening even if it was in, in places rough to go through. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And at the time it might not have been that clear. A lot of this, I mean when I think back I can't remember much of being 21 to 18. I can remember events. I just don't remember <laughs> how I processed yeah. them. I was kind yeah. of like a drone. Okay. But now, looking back, knowing what I know, Captain Hindsight, mm -hmm. I can figure out why they did that. And I actually, later on, was a squad leader with one of my old drill instructors. Him and I are great friends to this day. And I missed him being my absolute drill instructor like in my platoon by a week. Mm -hmm. So 
all of these things that I experienced, I could ask him, hey, do you know this guy? Why did you guys do this? And he would laugh, and he could tell me exactly why. Mm -hmm. Okay, so parts of it were kind of a mystery, at least at the time. At the time, yeah. Okay, uh, now, what proportion of people got through without having to be recycled or anything else? They'll, they'll do two things. It takes quite a bit to get booted out, mm -hmm. like at least at first. They'll drop people. So when you go into boot camp, you're told this is when you enter, this is your expected graduation date. Mm -hmm. But if you get injured, you get dropped. And they have a, I don't know the actual numbers, but they do have a formula. They have a method to it. How much time you can wait in this healing platoon. How much time will it take before you're put into the next cycle behind you. So you're kind of put in a pur uh, purgatory. Mm -hmm. You're in limbo. And then you get put back into the cycle and you finish out. Right. Some guys could take could do the basic 13 weeks to graduate. Other guys could do 20. Mm -hmm. 22. I think the oldest guy on the, on the depot when I got there was there for like 23 weeks. Mm -hmm. and like, man, that's horrible. Or, tw sorry, 23 months. Wow. Oh, that's months, sorry. Wow. That is, I guess most of them, if an injury is bad enough, then yeah. you just get rid of them. But okay. All right. So, now, do you get through on schedule? I did. Okay. Uh, and once you complete that stage of training, now what do you do? You, um, well, for me, I had a pretty unorthodox way. When I graduated, it was October 30th, 2009. Um, Halloween was hitting, and usually you have a leave block. Some guys get a week, some guys get a month. It really depends on the School of Infantry has Marine Corps combat training and then SOI for the Infantry Marines, depending how their cycle is, because that is where you get your basic combat training. Mm -hmm. It's not boot camp, but it's like one step above it because you're controlled in every aspect. You're not in the fleet Marine mm -hmm. Force yet. So in between that time, depending on what they have, you have limo, you have leave. They sent us home for recruiter's assistance. I was home for 30 days on recruiter's assistance. Basically, brainwashed PFC, Marine Corps is amazing, although I don't know anything about it yet, mm -hmm. saying, I'm going to go recruit my buddies. And you go home and you assist the recruiter that brought you in. So you, it's pretty nice because you're paid, you still are working, you can wear the nice uniforms, you can go meet girls, you can talk to other guys. And the idea is you get numbers to help mm -hmm. recruiting. But you can also be with your family. So was this when you had the exchange with the recruiter about your not taking the armor training? Uh, that by that time, later? it kind of blew over. Because, okay. I mean, recruiters come from all fields. It's not mm -hmm. just infantry. Um, we had guys from logistics. We had guys from the mail office. There's a mail mm -hmm. office in the Marine Corps. I don't know why, but there is. Um, my recruiter was infantry. So there's a lot of talking between them and some of these other guys. We call them pogues, mm -hmm. persons other than grunts, because we have our own standard. And there's a lot of animosity over that term. And people getting mm -hmm. bent out of shape over it. There'd be a lot of back and forth saying, you have the degree, you have the best job, you can sit in armor, be in skate, and I'd look at him and go, yeah, but some of us work harder, I'm gonna go be in the infantry, <laughs> woo. Didn't know anything about it yet, wasn't right. even in the infantry <laughs> yet. All right, so you get your, your month, but now within a month of the over, that's like through, through November, or so you're, or through, yep. yeah. So I get to, I got to SOI, either, either the end of November or the first week of December, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. And I was in SOI. They divide that into two phases. There's the basic phase. I don't know about MCT. That is just like an escalating course because all those guys, they're not they're support roles. Mm -hmm. They do a basic combat training and then they go to their actual occupational specialty right. school. Mm -hmm. Mine is SOI. So we get there and the first half, everybody's in together. You're learning the basics of a rifleman, fire team movements, land navigation, the basic things that are universal in every skill. The second half of SOI is when you actually get into your job, machine gunner, anti-tank missileman, rifleman, assault men, so mm -hmm. on. Um, we had a weird break because everything fell at Christmas time. Yeah. And the Marine Corps, even them, they like to, unless you're deployed, people in the rear like to see their families. Mm -hmm. So th we had a long leave block. Again, I got another three weeks of recruiter's assistance to go home on leave. So mm -hmm. here I've been in the Marine Corps five months, two of it I've been on leave and helping bring guys into the system and then we go back and when we came back it was a split we did the first phase of SOI Christmas break mm -hmm. and then we did your specialty phase okay now in your specialty phase uh, what range of weapons did you train with I am an O352 anti-tank missileman all right we trained with an SOI we trained up on medium and heavy anti-tank missile systems and we have a very brief introduction to rockets for some reason, Assaultman, which is an 0351, they, they have the demolition. They learn how to do C4 explosives. A lot like a combat engineer, mm -hmm. but in a 
in the infantry lexicon. They, for some reason, learned the small, which is the the small, the law, and the AT-4 are the light mm -hmm. anti-tank rockets. Missiles have guidance systems or copy their expensive. Rockets are very simple. Mm -hmm. Point, shoot. Yeah. And well, the rockets are the sort of essentially like the, the shoulder fire or yeah. handheld ones. Yeah. yeah, and so is the, the jab one would be a missile system, but it's it, it's an eighty thousand dollar missile that's heat seeking. Mm -hmm. So when you lock on with this computer involved, it's a lot more complex than a little law rocket that you extend, put in your shoulder, and shoot and send out range. Well, do you know if the law was essentially the same thing they were using back in Vietnam? Or? It was the exact same thing. Okay, but the, the law is obsolete now. I had one in Afghanistan. And that's a lie, you never touch one. You hear about it, you get a manual. This is what mm -hmm. the law is. If you ever see one, it's this mythical object. <laughs> Everybody wants one. We were trained on, I was trained on the Javelin system and the Sabre system. It, the Toe 2 came out of Vietnam, mm -hmm. and the Sabre was the new version of it. Right. We got to briefly see a Toe 2. My phase was actually one of the first phases that was doing just the Sabre training. They were phasing out the Toe 2 mm -hmm. completely. And we saw one just because certain units still had it, and they wanted us to not be surprised when we came across it. But by the time I got out of the Marine Corps, everything, in theory, was supposed to be the Saber tow system. Okay. Now, the kinds of uh, conflicts that, that we had gotten ourselves into by 2009 or whatever were largely ones that were sort of asymmetric. The enemy didn't have a whole lot of heavy equipment. Um, what other uses were there for these anti-tank missiles and things like that? They still have jeeps. They still have trucks. Okay. Um, you never know when a truck's going to pop up with a 50 cal or a, gr a group of guys on it. And our javelins, they're expensive, but they're cheaper than using Harriers to blow them up or Apaches mm -hmm. or, or million-dollar missiles that are coming off of, I'm trying to remember the name, what we call them, uh, JDAMs and stuff like that. It's a lot cheaper than that. Okay. So... We were, we were trained in the lighter rocket stuff because we were the ones to use it, but when you'd use the Javelin system, which had this little, they call it the clue, the command launch unit, it's, a glorified, it's glorified night vision. Mm -hmm. You can hook a missile up to it and shoot that missile, and you can lock on to whatever this thermal image that you want to lock onto is, but you can also use it without the missile. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we'd have these command launch units, or we'd have a saber system, which I'll go into in a second, and it has thermal vision, it has night vision, it has daytime vision, and it has variable zoom. So you put this guy in an elevated position, like with a sniper team, or on top of a roof supporting his platoon, that's awesome okay. um, overwatch. All right, so you've got some sort of other benefits of this kind of equipment beyond just shooting at tanks. Recon, observation, and then if they somehow found a Russian T-72, you can <laughs> shoot that. Yeah. But sometimes they would have... Uh, Bongo trucks. I know Special Forces, they used the Javelin, all the, they still do. Mm -hmm. In 2008, I believe Special Forces in Iraq, they got into a pretty big confrontation where they ended up using, I think, eight Javelin missiles in one fight. And the reason was they did have a tank, mm -hmm. but they also had a lot of armored vehicles. They'd look at these trucks, they would commandeer um, Humvees that we would give to the Army. The Army mm -hmm. would lose them, and next thing you know, we had to blow up our own Humvees. Yeah. All right. Uh, so as you talked about, you were going to. You talked about the Javelin system, what was the Sabre system then? The Sabre system was, is still the tow missile. They've mm -hmm. had various versions of the tow. The big one at the time was the Toe 2 Bravo. It was the first. It's a wire guided missile. It has a range of up to about three and a half kilometers. You can push it past that, but that's like the, they call it the effective range because that's what we know we can hit. Past there, you're starting to play with red lines, running out mm -hmm. of wire. The environment, if the wind gusts too hard, it can snap a wire. You have an erratic missile. This. It's probably the best optic. It just wasn't really convenient. The actual optic you would look through, you would set it up on a tripod or on top of a moving vehicle, and there was all the mounts, just like for a machine gun to put on there, but it was like the size of that printer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have this giant optic that you turn it on. You have to wait three minutes for it to cool down because for the night vision to work, it has to be a certain temperature mm -hmm. inside for the heat variations. So you got to wait the time, and I was always, I was always thinking, you know, this thing is nice. It's a great optic, but it doesn't really seem the most practical because in an actual firefight, when I need to shoot right now, I don't have three minutes for something to warm up. Now with that, you're on top of a Humvee, you're in the turret. People are shooting at you; they're mm -hmm. not shooting at the door. I have this giant box, and if a bullet goes through, it's great. My night vision don't work. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, this isn't the best thing for a firefight, but when it comes to anti-armor, which was my first mm -hmm. assignment, was an anti-armor team. 
or for Overwatch in a fixed position on yeah. tripod, perfect. Perfect defense system. Um, that had variable zoom, and you could actually focus the lenses in night vision to where I could make out every feature on your face. Mm -hmm. So if for an optic, great, great implementation. All right. Uh, so you're learning those systems. Uh, other stuff they give you with that stage of training. What else um, do you do? Well, everything builds off of the basics of being a rifleman, mm -hmm. the fire team set up, how the fire teams interact within a squad. And at that time, that's what you learn because you're a PFC or a mm -hmm. Lance Corporal, and that's all you need to know. Okay. I mean, the Marine Corps likes to educate you, but they also want you to be in your box. The officers think. Mm -hmm. The squad leaders think. The staff and COs think. So the staff and COs and COs, they think. You're supposed to do your role, and as your time goes on and you learn more, it's any job, it's a tier system. You, mm -hmm. you upgrade, and the more you learn. So at that time, that was all we would learn, was just okay. the squad and fire teams. All right. Uh, and so how long did that training go on? That was about two and a half months. Okay. Now after that, are you ready to, for an assignment, or what yep. happens now? You graduate from SOI, and they already have your orders waiting for you. Um, say about two-thirds of my SOI class, we all went to 29 Palms, California, to 1-7. To and then there was a handful of guys that would go to Hawaii, mm -hmm. that would go to 3rd Marine Regiment, I don't know which unit they ended up in. And it was only a handful. And then there was like three guys that went to 5th Marines out of San Mateo at Camp Pendleton. All right, now what was 29 Palms like? When you first get there, it's hell on earth. I mean, there's nothing there. There's, there's a, a desert tortoise that you can't touch or look at, otherwise it dies. And there's environmentalists to remind you of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's barren. It's the, it's the Marine Corps Combat Center, the Air Ground Combat Center. And it's, I think if you were to take 29 Palms, you could fit two Pendletons of Hawaii and Lejeune inside of it. Mm -hmm. Now, the main side, when you first get there, where you see life in the city, that's nice and it's concentrated, but there's so much past that. The mm -hmm. only time you see it is when you're on Range Road or you're looking at a map. Mm -hmm. um, the drive out there was at night. We got there at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. You'll notice that trend. They always get you there at night so you can mm -hmm. start the next morning. And uh, we ride through the desert. It's probably two and a half, three hour drive on the bus. We get to the old come barracks. My unit didn't have the up-to-date stuff. They just transitioned out of old barracks and their mm -hmm. one barracks was an outdoor old obsolete barracks for the base. For some reason the comm school, communication school, they get the new barracks. Mm -hmm. Our company office wasn't the new one. It was the old shacks from like Vietnam era. These wow. things were top of the line in the 80s. And but it was nice because everything was outdoors. If you wanted to have a meeting or a platoon or a company meeting, everybody just waits outside the building. Mm -hmm. So we get there in the middle of the night, and everybody kind of gets split into their units. I knew automatically because I was a weapons trade, anti-tank missileman. Most machine gunners and myself and Mordman would go to weapons company. So we had an idea where we were mm -hmm. going. Riflemen go to the line units, and then they get a handful of machine gunners and Mordman with them to work the smaller systems, 240s and 60-millimeter uh, mortars. Okay. Uh, and you were mentioning other un units other guys got assigned to. So what was your unit? Mine was 1-7, 1st Battalion, 7th okay. Marines. All right. Uh, and did you, in fact, go into their weapons company? I did. Okay. I went into weapons company. It was weapons company for my first two years, and later on it became dog company, and I shuffled it around. But mm -hmm. we can get to that later. All right. Uh, what kind of reception do you get? I mean, you've got men who are already in the unit that you're joining, right? So There was a first sergeant waiting for us. They had been back from Iraq for maybe a month. A lot of them were just coming back on leave. Mm -hmm. And they may have been back for two months because maybe a a fraction of the unit was actually there. Right. Some were still on leave. Many were off at training schools. And the idea was when you come back from a deployment, your, your guys go to leaders courses. They go to assault climbers. They go to sniper school mm -hmm. or machine gun leaders. So all these different schools to build up their career. And that's the natural progression of the career. So a lot of guys are gone at that. We have no clue mm -hmm. who's really there. We just meet a handful of guys, and some of them were on their first time as a senior Marine. They're on a power trip, and they mm -hmm. wanted to assert their dominance, and that is where hazing comes in. Okay. So how does that work? Um, well, first, you sit in a room, and you hear people talk to you, and you have no clue who they are. You don't know if they're a good Marine or a bad Marine. And everybody just wants to yell at you. Everybody wants you to clean things. They want to keep you up all night. Um, the hazing gets worse as time goes on because you're not really settled in yet. They have to issue a room. They have to put you in the right platoon. So for your first few days at that company, they're trying to get their stuff in order. And you got every senior Marine there, and 
anybody can come mess with you because they're a senior. I mean, you're the new guy on the block. You don't know who's who. They don't even know if you're going to be in their platoon. And then probably about a weekend, you're assigned to a specific platoon. And then the command structure is more real because instead of just knowing the top, the commander and the first sergeant, mm -hmm. now you know this is your platoon sergeant. This is your fire team. This is your lieutenant. And everything is highlighted and everything is just made abundantly clear. Now at that point, does the, does the sort of hazing ease off or life get more regular? Life gets regular, but the hazing doesn't ease off until after your first deployment. Okay. Now, hazing is a bad term because nobody wants to be hazed. There's a big movement out, no hazing mm -hmm. in the Marine Corps. Right. If you actually, now, if you yell at a Marine in the wrong tone or call him a name, people will say it's hazing. Mm -hmm. God forbid you yell at a Marine. God forbid you call him an asshole. Hazing, you hurt his feelings. But my first two years in, that's commonplace. Mm -hmm. Hazing, for me, we had one guy. Now, th this is a report that we got. We always got told about it. Animal Company of 1-7, we had different phonetic names than other units. Mm -hmm. A kid had a broom shoved up his ass and broken off. That Marine went to the brig for doing it. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that's probably the epitome of hazing. He yeah. literally had a broom in him. Yeah. We heard horror stories of that. Worst hazing I ever had was on field day. Every Thursday, you cleaned. You cleaned that barracks top to bottom. And seniors would come in with sandbags, cut the sand open in your room after you clean the whole thing. And you're like, really? The sand's never going to leave. Mm -hmm. Or they'd come in, they'd keep you up till 4 in the morning cleaning toilets and stuff. And It was really just trivial things. They'd reach their hand into the toilet bowl, up into a pipe. What's this? Clean some more. Who's going to look in there? Um, we had guys get into full mop suits, all of their chemical warfare gear, with sweatsuit underneath, flak jacket, gas mask. Then they would dump gallons of bleach in the shower and make you do push-ups in the shower with the water on hot all the way up. That's okay. hazing. That is hazing. But adult character. All right. Uh, so, so how long did that side of things go on for you? Now, we would train. So usually during the work week, we would do, if we were in the rear, it would be doing basic company level things mm -hmm. and then everybody would kind of push out into different <laughs> ranges and field events to do the pre-deployment workups. Mm -hmm. And at that point, as a PFC, I didn't leave base for six months because you're training so often mm -hmm. and you're constantly out in the field and you come back, you're maybe in the rear for three or four days a week, including the weekend. Some training events would be two week events. So you'd be out there for 14, 15 days in the field. And when you're on the field, it's not training. It's, or it's not hazing, it's mm -hmm. team building yeah. and it's training. You're going to have to be able to survive in the worst events when you're in country. So when you're on the field, you got to simulate that every way you can. Mm -hmm. Everything builds mental toughness. Okay. Uh, now, over the course of time, you do this, you kind of get to know people. Mm -hmm. um, do you get treated any better? Or are there only certain people who like to do mess with you? And The hierarchy in your chain of command kind of dictates that. And it, ownership. Mm -hmm. Everything is ownership in the Marine Corps. Uh, Team leader is responsible for his team. Mm -hmm. Squad leader is responsible for his teams and his team leaders. You take responsibility for that, and as such, they're the people that discipline you, and they mess with you. If another mm -hmm. platoon comes over, yeah. another squad leader who just wants to be on a power trip, or mm -hmm. we call like the bad Marines, we call them shitbags. Mm -hmm. You might have a shitbag who doesn't have a position, who just wants to flex his four-year authority mm -hmm. over you. That's where problems come down. We would have platoon-on-platoon platoon brawls, and it was kind of fun, because I was part of... Combined Anti-Armor Team 1, and there were two of us. We were called the Combined Anti-Armor Team Cat. We called Cat 2 Cat Poo mm -hmm. because they had all the turds of the battalion. <laughs> and these guys would come out, and they would, and these are the same guys on the weekends that would get DUIs. Mm -hmm. They would, one guy, I think he, he punched his wife, got a DUI, and tried fighting the police. All in one night. He mm -hmm. really liked to party. And so you can tell not the greatest individuals. Mm -hmm. We would talk shit to them, they would talk it back, and sometimes our sergeants, a lot of these guys, they had pre-existing problems with each other, just, some people don't mesh well. Mm -hmm. One sergeant gets into a fight with another corporal out there, just trying, like, he is disciplining him or telling him, hey, you can't do something, like, in the Marine Corps, we have all our uniform orders, you have to wear a hat outside or a cover. If you, somebody's not wearing a cover, he yells at him, he says, hey, fuck you, and then the sergeant goes over to lock him on some more, next thing you know, you get somebody, guy, one of the guys yells, Cat up, cat one up. All the cat one guys are looking out the room going, what's going on? And then he yells, cat two up. All the cat two guys look out, and all we see is our people fighting. So everybody's going to jump in. We're not going to break it up. We're going to back them up. Mm -hmm. So the next thing you know, you have 25 people in the second story of an outdoor barracks brawling. And it takes all of the duties in this barracks to come break it up. 
Yeah, so duties. does that mean the the people on like it's, every barracks had a duty? Every company had to put a person for the day, and their job is to sit behind a desk, answer the phone call, mm -hmm. when you're in charge of working parties, and just enforce discipline. Right. The basic guards of the day, mm -hmm. and they would have to sort all this out. And it was I always laughed with that because as much as we would do that and beat each other up, these are the same guys we'd all be drinking with on the weekend because mm -hmm. all of us knew each other. And we'd all help each other out because it's just like an organization. You got to take care of first the people next to you, but then you take care of your brothers and your company. And mm -hmm. There would be fights company on company. Animal company would mess with weapons company. Next thing you know, it's a 120-person brawl, and the battalion commanders involved disciplining officers. Stuff like that happens, but it's mm -hmm. fun because so you got your unit rivalry, and you have the the camaraderie building up within the unit, and that that stays mm -hmm. all the way through the deployment. All right, so. Um, so you're, how long then did you stay at 29 Palms when you first got there? I was in 29 Palms, I was stationed there at 29 Palms my whole t whole time in active duty. Right. But well, I was in 29 you go Palms training. training. Yeah. I left for Okinawa, Japan. Gosh, I can't remember the month I actually left. I want to say it was the late summer mm -hmm. of 2010. Okay. And it was about the time North Korea just sunk a South Korean frigate off their coast. That's when we left for Okinawa to go on the 31st Expeditionary Unit. Okay. Uh, so now when the, the time comes to deploy, I mean, how does that play out? What happens? So before you deploy, the, the company level, all the planning, they get their order from the Marine Corps probably a good eight months out. Mm -hmm. And that's how they build all their training. They know what they have to get done. So while we were doing all these events out in the field, doing these ranges, that's all organized and structured to build on each other all the way to the point you deploy. And then you get on a plane, your unit over the span of two weeks moves because they don't want to move everybody at one time. There's operational security and a lot of other factors playing into that. Just the logistics mm -hmm. is a big one. Everybody gets in Okinawa, and then you have about three to four weeks in Okinawa just getting logistics ready to get on boat because you move on to a Navy ship, everything embarks, and then you leave port. You go out into the ocean, and you're going to different countries. We had typhoons hit Okinawa when we were there, so we had to delay two weeks, mm -hmm. which was nice for us. We didn't want to live on a ship that long. But the bad part was jungle warfare training, okay. which was hell. Then once we leave Okinawa, we're on boat, and that is when the, ex the, the Mew is actually doing their role in the global presence. We sat off the coast of North Korea for probably about two weeks. Um, animal company trained with South Korean Marines. <laughs> After that, we would go to the Philippines. We would work with the Philippine military, doing bilateral training in uh, Crow Valley out of Subic Bay. A typhoon hit there, so we had to leave, cut that training short, and then our unit provided humanitarian relief to the Philippines and to the people of that area because of all the damage that was done. We went to Guam. We would go to Singapore. Later on, a year later, Animal Company, because they were taking on a... Uh, which I got reassigned to, but not at this point. They became advisors, an advising company. They were a division project. They had to go to Singapore, mm -hmm. and they were working with the Singapore Marines as a bilateral event, but also to learn about these advisor roles. Okay. A lot of different kinds of things going on. Uh, the Jungle Training School in Okinawa, what does that consist of? A lot of hiking in the jungle. Um, basically, all of your squad movements and everything you would do as a normal unit, it changes depending on your environment. You, in the desert, everything's open. It's fast. Mm -hmm. You can spread out. In a jungle, you can't see five feet away from you. So it's learning how to maneuver, how to effectively operate in this environment. And then there's also other schools that certain Marines could go to for a jungle survival, where you go out there with the bare minimum, and there are, there's a whole school for it, and they teach you how to survive in the jungle by building a shack out of woods, how to light a fire while it's raining, how to kill a snake and eat it without poisoning yourself, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Basic survival. Okay. All right, and then that when you go out um, with the fleet, what kind of ship are you on? I was on, I actually don't know the tactical name. And I've been trying to remember the name of the ships I was on for a long time. Um, one, Harper's Ferry. It was in the USS Harper's Ferry before it was retired. And that ship would fit hovercraft into the back of it. And because I was part of an Anna Armour team, all of our Humvees, along with 3rd LAR, 3rd LAR, Light Armored Reconnaissance, they sent a platoon on this Mew with us. They're attached to us. Mm -hmm. All of our vehicles were on these hovercraft, and that's where they would stay when we were on boat. Mm -hmm. And the idea was we would we would load all our things onto these boats when we had to do an operation. Hovercrafts go out, and we hit a beach. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of our training was. Every time we went 
on a training event or to another country, if it wasn't on Liberty, it would be a hovercraft and beach landing. Okay. And the only people that hit the beach before us would have been Baker's company, and their role as a company was the boat team. They had all the Zodiac boats that you like Navy SEAL commercials, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. They were they actually went and trained with the SEALs to learn the Zodiac boat courses as part of their work up before deploying. They'd hit the beach and then our hovercrafts come behind. And the Zodiac is just a little inflatable motorboat, right? Yeah. Yep, and they're heavier than they look. Mm -hmm. And we had Baker's company on our boat, which was nice, and because everything was centralized, we could coordinate with the units that were going in before us. It was also fun because when you have 40 days out in the ocean, and part of their training is to take these boats out, you can be like, hey, mm -hmm. I got nothing going on today, can I join you guys? As long as you cleared it with command, nobody cared. Okay. So did you do uh, sort of beach landings in various places then? We did some, we had beach landings in Okinawa, we did them in Guam. We had a lot of operations, and a lot of it was like two two week long exercises where you would land on a beach, and you were just one. I was a cog in the machine. Mm -hmm. We would land, we would set up our security, and everything was notional because it was a training event. But in the event, it was a real thing. This was the order of how things would work. Baker goes in, we set up security with our vehicles behind them, and behind us is coming the logistics um, headquarters, or headquarters company, and then the other company is filling their roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, when you were doing these things, did you do any exercises with any foreign troops, or was this just all American? Uh, the, the South Korean, I think, Rock Marines. Mm -hmm. um, that was a big one. The Filipino, I don't know if it was Army or Marines, but the Filipino military, we worked with them. And those were the two big ones. We worked with the Japanese security force when we were in Okinawa twice, mm -hmm. before going on ship and after. Okay. What impressions did you have of these people? My, my being a weapons company... My exposure to them was very limited at mm -hmm. that time. I saw a bunch of Royal Marine or a bunch of Rock Marines get on our boat, and they had guns full of ammo, and we weren't allowed to have ammo. Mm -hmm. And they ended up getting kicked off the boat by the captain because they're not supposed to bring ammo <laughs> onto the ship. <laughs> so that was the only impression I had of them at the time. Um, one of our boats, the the Essex, was I think the weed carrier mm -hmm. or the amphibious cruiser of our group. It stopped in Hong Kong at one point in the, tri in the trip, and a buddy of mine had to do a weapons display because they came into the harbor and they set up all these weapons systems, and that was pretty much a, a show mm -hmm. for diplomats and for the different militaries. Because uh, I know the ambassador was there, numerous um, Chinese, Japanese, pretty much any regional power, mm -hmm. they all had a dignitary there. And it was going on this boat, they were walking, seeing these weapons systems, and I think that was a good summary of that deployment. It was a show of force and more okay. presence and bilateral training. It was diplomacy. Mm -hmm. We were just a small piece in that machine at the time. Okay. And then you said in the Philippines after the typhoon, you went back, provided humanitarian aid? Yep. Yeah. We, first we went out, or we, we had to leave, because we were training with them and we were living in this little village on the edge of a village. We set mm -hmm. up our little marine town, and then you could walk out the wire, and you were in a little Filipino town, which was dirt floors, mm -hmm. bamboo hut, five goats and a family with no clothes living in this hut. That was my first time ever seeing something like that. That was eye-opening. Which would, it benefited me when I went to Afghanistan because I knew exactly how bad conditions could be for certain people. Mm -hmm. But that was your first time seeing it. And you could go into the village and they had a whole line of uh, trading huts set up. Because every three, four months this rotation comes through. There's a spring mm -hmm. and fall when they know Marines very well. And you could walk through this hut and you could trade your watch for a taser. Um, butterfly knives, that was a popular item. Anything that was almost illegal or you can't get through customs, mm -hmm. you could get right there and you could get it for your watch or if you had something of value to trade to them. There was no ATMs around, so money mm -hmm. was limited. Okay. Uh, and could you get in trouble in these places? You could. We constantly got safety briefs of what not to do to cause, what to do to not cause an international incident. Mm -hmm. And then the basic courtesies, I mean, some of the stuff's common sense. Like, hey, you go into a village, don't rape the women. Sadly, somebody at some time did that, mm -hmm. so we have to sit through an hour brief and say, okay, if you help somebody with their car, if you go to a shop, don't rape the woman. Got it. Thank you, some guy. Mm -hmm. no, I don't know, was there prostitution in these places? In the Philippines, yeah, we had one night of libo, and the and the very last night before the trip, because everything had cut short, and they had obviously they needed time to get everything on boat before this mm -hmm. typhoon hit. So we got about six hours to go out on Subic Bay, and this they call it Subic Bay. It was an old Navy port, and mm -hmm. it still is a port, but there's a town in there. Yeah, 
I remember I was walking down the street with some buddies, and there was a place called Wind's Bar and Grill. We walk in, and it just looks like a bar that just opened up. Mm -hmm. There was a long bar. There was Jose Cuervo everywhere. <laughs> Every wall had, like, five deep bottles of Jose Cuervo. We're like, okay, it's a tequila bar. Rock on. We're having, having some drinks. About 6 o'clock, the lights turn on. There's a stripper pole. There's the neon lights everywhere, and 40 Filipino women walk in the front door, and every guy in there instantly goes, oh, good good advertising, guys. He, mm -hmm. he got us with the bar and grill, and he made us there. And by the end of the night, it seemed like my whole battalion was in there, three, 400 people or more, just hanging out, having a good time, getting loaded before they went back on ship. Our first sergeant was very faithful to his wife. Uh, Hooker kept propositioning to uh, kept propositioning him. I won't say his name just because mm -hmm. I don't want to defame yeah. anybody, but she kept propositioning him. And he kept saying, "No, get away from me! I'm not doing this." And eventually, he punched the hooker in the face, and he had to get taken to the ship before the local police could come find him. I mean, half of us were like, "Yeah, you do that." The other half were like, oh, "Shit, did you see him? He punched the hooker in the face." <laughs> Well, I don't know. I guess his wife probably would have preferred that anyway. So oh, yeah. It's a fun story. He didn't come out of his office for about a week, and when he came out, he just said, things happen when you're drunk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he left it at that. But there's not much he can say. In that deployment, we called, it, we called it a booze cruise because as much training as we did and as much as we were out there doing, we had a lot of time off. People in Afghanistan don't get that time off. Right. And then what were you actually able to do in terms of helping people after the typhoon? Um, it was a lot of air support. We would, we honestly never set foot on the ground. Okay. We would go on the deck, and we were part of working parties, just bringing supplies up that right. would end up going into a net and be airlifted to them. Okay. I think there was a small portion of the Navy that actually went on the shore to distribute these things, mm -hmm. but it was limited. Okay. All right. So how long did that whole cruise last? Um, I got back, let's see, Christmas. I was still there. Sometime in January or February I got back. Okay, so now we're in 2011? Yep, we're in 2011. Okay. Um, about three three or four months later, a nuclear reactor melted down in Japan. Mm -hmm. I remember that because we just missed that, and the people that replaced us had to do support for that. Okay. And that was when the workup for Afghanistan started, because we came back. We had about two months off. Liberty, come back, go to your respective schools. I went to uh, anti-armor leaders course with a group of guys. I picked up corporal two years in at the dot, and... When we came back from these leader schools, we were told there's a boot drop coming. You're going to get new guys. We got three. Mm -hmm. We got three new. We had a lot of people. I had a very mm -hmm. big boot drop. So we got three new guys. And eventually we get more new guys, but they kept going to Animal Company and nobody knew why. Mm -hmm. Every company had about 120 people. Animal Company had 210 people. And they, did they not know math? <laughs> the lower guys are making fun mm -hmm. of the officers saying, like, what idiots. We can't, even, we can't even fill a fire team or a squad. They got more people than they know what to do with. Turns out division came down, and prior to this time, Special Forces, the Army Special Forces, they do um, FID missions, Foreign Internal Defense, advising missions, mm -hmm. essentially, and they do it in small teams. The Marine Corps and the Army, non-Special Forces, the traditional units, they do it too, but it'd be small teams of mm -hmm. 7 to 20 people, give or take. Division came down and said, we're going to do this, but we want to do it on a company level. If we're supposed to win hearts and minds, if we're supposed to partner with these militaries of the Afghan army, and they're supposed to be able to stand on two feet, we need to train all of them, not 20 guys mm -hmm. to 4,000. So they set up four army teams, army partner teams, and then it's either three or four army or Marine. police teams okay. to advise the local police. Mm -hmm. And then we actually had MPs. We had MPs get attached to our unit from Pendleton and the military police, they were the ones that trained the local police with mm -hmm. Marine infantry. And then I got pulled from, at this time it became Dog Company. They pulled me down to be a squad leader in Animal Company. Um, Animal Company, 4th, AT4, Army Team 4, 2nd Squad. So my, everything I'd been trained up and known prior to this time was mm -hmm. just thrown out the window. All right. So now you're actually working, when you're saying Army, like as in the other branch of the service Army. No, um, or, Army team, we would partner with the Afghan Army. Or the Ar Afghan Army. So they were setting us up to be this advising team. Okay. And it's a massive company, and the idea would be once we go to Afghanistan, each platoon or each team 
all four army teams, you're going to pair up with a company mm -hmm. of Afghan soldiers. So instead of having 20 guys like they originally had, now we have an entire unit, and each platoon is 35, 40 people, give or take. 35, 40 advisors to each company. Mm -hmm. We've already doubled the amount of people that are working with the Afghans, just on the raw numbers. So that's a lot more time to work with each individual person. Right. And you spread that out over an entire um, area of operations, a combat zone. And so that's a lot more people we're working with. And then you add in the police, the police teams. We had the headquarters elements. And then you had Baker Company, Charlie Company, and Dog Company. Weapons became Dog. They were traditional line units, and they were supporting us and also doing their regular combat operations. Okay. Now, in the kind of broader background for, for the Afghan conflict, there was a phase of it that was officially labeled being a surge in terms of kind of duplicating what had happened in, in Iraq sometime earlier. Now, was this sort of expansion part of that, as far as you know? I believe not? it might have been. The timeline would add up. Yeah. I know at the time uh, President Obama was committing more troops to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and a lot of, at that, I wasn't paying attention to foreign policy like right. I do now. I wasn't studying it. Um, they keep you in your box. My level, I was just concerned with mm -hmm. what I had to do right. in my day-to-day -day life. And I remember see, hearing this stuff on the news and talking about it, but I never pieced it together because we went into saying again, but there were so many other areas of Afghanistan, and not just Helmand Province. The U.S. Army, I think, put up a bulk of those numbers in the mm -hmm. northern provinces. Okay. Now, how long did you spend preparing to go to Afghanistan? 2011, better part of 2011, probably about close to a year, a little okay. bit less. How much did they actually teach you about the, the country or the culture or anything like that? Once I got assigned, when I was in dog company, it was a lot of, um, first it was training for the terrain, because I didn't know I was going to animal company. Mm -hmm. we, we would say the term they sold me to them. But um, first we did terrain training, mountain warfare. We'd go to Bridgeport, California, which is a national park. It's not a Marine Corps training installation, but the Marine Corps has a small chunk of land where they built barracks and houses, and there's a very small population of personnel there, and their whole purpose is to train us in mountain warfare. Mm -hmm. And that would be Marine or uh, mountain sniper course, uh, mountain leaders, summer and winter packages. They would do it on, the, obviously, the small units like that, assault climbers, but then they would also do battalion packages, which is what we did. So we went as an entire battalion into the mountains to learn mountaineering, basic levels of it are enough to get by. And then after that, I came back to 29 Palms. I was at a firing range, and I was told, hey, you've been sold. You're going to Animal Company. You're going to be a squad leader there. Part of me was bitter because the people that I've known just sold me out. Mm -hmm. The other part of me was happy because there was a lot of tension with some of those people, and it was a whole new fresh slate. I was a new NCO at the time. Mm -hmm. So now I get a fresh new start with a new group of guys that can actually be a true NCO, and I don't have any baggage from the past. Okay. And at that point, everything changed. I was no longer part of an armor team or a line unit. I was part of an advising team. So I was already a leader's course, so I knew the squad leader aspect. Then they send us to a language course. Three Marines went to San Diego State, actually more, I think it was like five or six. They went to San Diego State to learn Pashtu and Dari, mm -hmm. the local dialects. And everybody else, and I was part of everybody else, we went to just the language resource center for about a month to get a crash course in Dari. So we could try to understand some, but a month is nowhere near enough mm -hmm. to learn an, an, an Afghan dialect. And then after that, it was the cultural awareness, the cultural training. All our training events, when, when the regular line companies would go into the field to do their combat operations, that stuff changes. That stuff, or that stuff changes, but it stays the same mm -hmm. overall. We went to the field to work with, um, they call them contractors. We work with the special operations community a lot and the schools that trained them. MARSOC uses the schools. Special forces would come in and out and use these schools. And it was the schools that would train them for advanced advising, for advanced medical care, all the advanced tactics that a regular unit doesn't get to go on because mm -hmm. they can't build that much time into it. We did that. They would bring in Afghan civilians that immigrated to the U.S., mm -hmm. a lot of them from San Francisco and L.A., and these guys would donate their time to be a role player. Mm -hmm. They would only speak Afghan languages, Pashtu, Dari, Farsi, Arabic, and they would simulate being the AMA. So we were learning how to work as an advisor, as a foreign advisor to these people. And then all of that stuff comes up to um, Mojave Viper, the, the month-long training exercise before you deploy to a combat zone. Mm -hmm. That had been in place. We were, there's nothing new for us. Every unit that went to Afghanistan or Iraq had been doing that since, I think, 2005. 
Now, Mojave, so that, is that basically at Par 29 Palms? Or? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Being part of the Marine Corps Combat Center, we had the best training. We had the best best ranges at our disposal. It was our backyard. Mm -hmm. All the other units in the Marine Corps would have to fly there, mm -hmm. do that month-long exercise, or drive if they're from Pendleton, mm -hmm. and then go. Some of them would do that and then go on leave and deploy. Mm -hmm. Other units would go on their liberty for a month. They would go to Mojave Viper, and they'd fly from Mojave Viper to Afghanistan or Iraq. Mm -hmm. It just played out how, how the logistics worked out. All right. So what did you wind up doing? We went to Mojave Viper for a month. We had two to three weeks of liberty, and then we all met back in 29 Palms and started pushing out. All right. Now how do they get you to Afghanistan? You fly. They fly, I'm trying to think with LAX or no, we went from an airfield, an airfield, uh, Air Force field somewhere by Marietta. I don't know the actual mm -hmm. name of the field. You get on a, on a Delta flight. Sometimes it's Delta, sometimes it's Continental. It's just whoever can fly you there. Mm -hmm. They fly you to Europe. My, some of my buddies landed in Ireland. I landed in Germany. Mm -hmm. And that's where you switch to a C-130 and you fly. No, they didn't switch to a C-130. They just switched the air carriers because mm -hmm. of international law. Mm -hmm. We got into, a, I think, Lufthansa flight, and that flew us to Kyrgyzstan, to Manas Air Base. And that's where, it's an airfield, it's an actual U.S. Air Base, and mm -hmm. I think the lease is expiring soon. But at the time, that was the place. Anybody who went into Afghanistan, they went through Manas. Mm -hmm. You land in Manas, you have a week-long um, adjustment, I'm trying to think of the right word for well, it. You have to kind of adjust maybe a little bit, just the, the climate and the physical. The climate, area, yeah. the time zones, and mm -hmm. that's the whole point of that week, is yeah. to adjust. And then at the end of that week, and that's Army, Air Force, Marines, Special Forces Community, and Special Operations were all out of this place. Um, all NATO forces went through. They were Australians. Mm -hmm. Royal Marines were going through there. When we were pushing through, the Polish military was in there. And what you would do is you'd get on the C-130 the day you have to leave, and they would stagger your flights. Like one company or half a company would fly out one day, mm -hmm. and they would all build off that. You'd get on a C-130. They flew us to Leatherneck, or Camp Leatherneck. Helmand Province, you land there, you get on a bus, you do some shifting around the base because weather deck in Camp Bastion. Mm -hmm. You're there for another th two or three days just for how big it is. You have to have station, uh, place, in this, place to sleep for a little bit. You have to have your officers have to have all their meetings with all the regional command. Mm -hmm. And then you have to get all of your ammo. You have to get outfitted completely with all the stuff that they give you once you're in country that you can't bring over borders. So once you have your combat load, all your gear, you're adjusted, you've done a basic range, they take you to Bastion, which was the British airfield connected to Leatherneck. You get on your Osprey or, or a heli certain helicopter, a Sea King, I don't know the actual mm -hmm. name of it, and then they fly you to your combat zone. All right. Now, just general orientation, what part of Afghanistan is Helmand Province? The north, south, east, west? Southern. Okay. So kind of above the Pakistani border there? Yep. Yeah. It borders Pakistan. Okay. It does. All right. Uh, so basically, you you got there. You had your orientation. They they load you up on something. Now what happens to you? When we first got well, in the perfect world, you would land at the forward operating base you're supposed to live out of. Mm -hmm. They flew us to the wrong one. So we fly into Sangin, and we land at Fab Nole. They changed all these names mm -hmm. in 2012 because they wanted them to reflect the local environments. So they gave them mm -hmm. posh two names. I can't remember them, and none of us ever used them because we didn't care. Um, it was Fob Nole, and it was on the southern tip of Sangin River Valley. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to go to Fob Alcatraz, which, would, fate would have it, was the northern border of the entire area of operation. Mm -hmm. And it bordered um, an Army area of operations mixed with uh, MARSOC, Marine SOCOM Command. Mm -hmm. So we had to drive. We just got off this flight. We've been up for two days. We had to get in the trucks, and Supply had to give us a ride all the way across the AO through Fob Jackson, which was the headquarters for Sangin. That was where the ANA command was. That's where all the battalion command would be at. We pushed past that, past Fob Anchorman to the north, and we ended up at Alcatraz, stationed with Dog Company. Dog Company was the unit that was supposed to reside and run Alcatraz. Mm -hmm. We were, my platoon, Animal 4, was attached to the Afghan Army Company there. So Dog Company is your old unit, right? Yep. Okay. Yep, so I knew a lot of familiar faces. All right. Uh, now, let's see. So what do you start doing now? That actually go to work? What happens? Well, the structure of a deployment is supposed to be seven months, and you really only have 
maybe five months to get something done because that first month you're there, you're building relationships, okay. it's introductions. As advisors, our commander has to sit down with the Afghan commander. We have to sit down with our peers and so on. The regular Marines are, are our, our lowest level Marines that are meeting with the lowest level Afghan army. I'm meeting with the sergeants of the Afghan army. My platoon commander and staff and CEO were sitting down with their equivalents and their peers. And a lot of it was shaking hands mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how we were going to do things, the best way to do it. There was um, an element of the Afghan army out of Alcatraz, and there was an element living at a patrol base in the actual river valley. And mm -hmm. all it was, a few years prior, the U.S. military came in, we paid a farmer to rent out or lease mm -hmm. his complex. So it was just a mud hut. Mud walls all the way around, pretty big on the inside, and that's what we operated out of. So we had to split our platoon in half. Half stayed up at Alcatraz with the ANA there, and then 12 of us, including myself, we had to do a 30-minute walk down into the woods with our pack, and what was in your pack was what you lived with. Mm -hmm. And we set up shop in this patrol base. So the first month was getting organized, getting established, building relationships, and then introductions to the AO. 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines was still there when we get in, and it's part of the, the relieving in place. Mm -hmm. The first week on the ground, they're taking you out, guiding you, showing you the patrol route, showing you common places of, of conflict, showing you all the local elders, the people you need to meet. Everything you need to know about the AO, they teach you in a week or two. And then it's yours, whether you like it or not. All right, well, let's take this dot up. So we are going to pause right here. All right, so we've gotten you basically out to Afghanistan, and you're kind of out on now, kind of a small post. Uh, Going to be in the valley, but not and not up at Alcatraz, not, not the main base. Uh, what was your impression of the Afghan soldiers as you were meeting them? You had your orientation, then going down to join them. That's a good question. So, I'd met a few Afghan soldiers before this point, and the trends were the same. I mean, none of us spoke the same language. A few of them had taught themselves some English. Mm -hmm. uh, we had translators. We had two Terps. That's a whole other topic we can go into. Um, they were high a lot. The first time I ever saw Afghans, this truck, we call, them Ford, we call them the Danger Ranger. It's a Ford Ranger. They don't make them here in the States, and they don't sell mm -hmm. them here. They just sell them to Iraq and Afghanistan, apparently. This Ford Ranger pulls up, and in the bed of the truck, there is a Dishka, the Russian equivalent of a 50 caliber machine mm -hmm. gun, on a tripod. It's not bolted down. It's, like, moving around, and this guy's just kind of holding it, and you're thinking, that's effective. So... They pull up, the other guys pull this giant bag out of the back of their truck, and it was a trash bag of weed. Mm -hmm. I don't mean like this, I mean a massive bag. And this guy throws it over his shoulders, he looks at me and my buddies and says, Double good! But <laughs> doing the thumbs up, and he runs into his hut, and for the next three days all you could smell is pot. And they're not supposed to smoke pot. Their orders, they're not really effective at mm -hmm. enforcing discipline. They say they're not supposed to do drugs at all. They drink whiskey, they were smoking pot like it was going out of style. Opium, because Afghanistan's all about poppy and opium. Mm -hmm. I was living in the middle of about $10 million worth in a field. We were surrounded all the way to the river, which is about two kilometers, and then in every direction, poppy fields. Open fields for kilometers and kilometers. Mm -hmm. Eradic the drug eradication effort was a big thing at the time, so that was constantly moving. We were hearing about that through DEA contractors mm -hmm. that were in the country working with the military and the Afghan police. The army, they still, they, they weren't the most disciplined, some were. There were some sergeants that were there for the right reasons. There was one guy, his name was Ajmal. He was, by the end of the deployment, he was the only Afghan we would let come into our living quarters. He could walk in any time, he could mm -hmm. hang out. He had never seen um, porn magazines or Playboy before, so he would always want new magazines. Or he just, We'd be walking in, he doesn't read English, but he can understand pictures and things, mm -hmm. and he'd just be sitting there reading. we go, oh, hey Ajmal, how's it going? And he would always try to learn more English from mm -hmm. us. And he was dedicated. We asked him, why did you join the Army? He came from a more well-to-do family in Afghanistan. And he said, I want to help my country. I mean, my country's blown apart right now. It's in pieces. We have no order. Mm -hmm. The only place the government has authority, well, even when we were there, I don't care what CIA report you read, any document, they're full of shit. Mm -hmm. The only place that government has ever had authority was in Kabul. Mm -hmm. As soon as they walk out of a village and the gun isn't actually in the room, they have no authority there. Which is why you'd constantly see, say this is the Afghan army, they'd leave the village, the Taliban come in. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Taliban leave the village, the Afghan army comes in. It's just this constant sway back and forth. Half of the Afghan soldiers and police used to be Taliban. Mm -hmm. They just decided, oh, the government can pay me more money. But when the funds dry up, they're like a mercenary. They're gone to mm -hmm. the wind. Desertion was rampant. So we had Afghan soldiers getting high all the time. We had Afghan soldiers that would go on leave or just leave and never come back. Um, we had numerous ones that, through intelligence agencies and operations in the area, we knew that they were Taliban informants. Mm -hmm. We could track their cell phone signals. The only reason we hadn't arrested them or tried to set them up to detain them was because, I don't know how to classify some of this stuff is, we can track cell phones. Mm -hmm. We can track text messages through radio frequencies. This is nothing new. Yeah. There's a whole organization there, and every FOB has one where they track all the ongoing signals. One reason we didn't detain them is because we were getting more intel mm -hmm. out of them using their cell phone than by detaining them. Right. So we let them do what they did. We just monitored. We were diligent about them, and we kind of played devil's advocate. So there was that. Mm -hmm. And then being down at the PB, at, it was Patrol Base Watson. Living there, it was very isolated. We had 23 Afghan soldiers living with us, and we knew who they were. You could watch them. I mean, it's a hut, probably the size of a small parking lot, or smaller than that. Mm -hmm. It's very close, very intimate. People can't go far. The Afghan soldiers go on patrol on their own, and they come back, but if they're going to do something shady in their own time, the Marine Corps living area was maybe the size of this whole office. So we could keep closer tabs on them. Mm -hmm. We would take people that we knew were suspected to be informants, and they'd be down at this PB with us. You didn't sleep all at night, mm -hmm. regardless, but at least we could keep track on them there, and we could kind of weed them out and isolate variables that way. Um, so the Afghan army was very raggedy. They had some people that wanted to do a lot of good. They had a lot of guys that wanted to do good. They also had a lot of people that were just there because it was a solid paycheck. Mm -hmm which isn't too much different from anywhere else in the world. All right. Uh, so what were you actually doing with these guys? You're, you're down there, you're supposed to be training them or whatever. What's actually happening? We were supposed to train, advise, <laughs> and lead the Afghan military in combat operations. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and so what could you actually train them in? Or we could train them in the basic fundamentals of being an infantryman. So fire team, squad maneuvers and tactics, um, land navigation, IEDs. IEDs are the thing mm -hmm. of Afghanistan. Anti-IED warfare. So, mine sweeping. How to work the radio frequent or the uh, we call them the, the jammers. The, the, there's a Thor jammer. It's this backpack with a radio antenna, mm -hmm. and it would jam radio frequencies, and it was constantly updated so that way you could block whatever frequency they were using. We would train them in that, mm -hmm. but also we would have to loan them some of this gear because they wanted to operate. But they don't have this gear. They don't have the air support. They don't have the minesweepers. Mm -hmm. So when they would go on patrol, we would kind of give them the minesweepers. We would control the gear they have. But if they couldn't go out without that gear, a lot of times they wouldn't go out. Mm -hmm. So this was 2012. President Obama was saying the Afghans need to take the lead on everything. Mm -hmm. We were the ground level of that. Him saying that, mm -hmm. I was living it. No matter what was happening, we had to make them think they were in the front. And a lot of the times, it was making them think they were in the front, but they weren't, because if they were, we would have died. Because they weren't effective. Mm -hmm. They could barely stand and operate there. Their logistics were, were a sham. Their company commander embezzles personal funds and pays the troops when he sees fit. So mm -hmm. some of these guys didn't get paid for months on end. Or if they got paid, it was never the amount that they should have been paid. Embezzlement was rampant. Mm -hmm. um, Pashtun. The Pashtun co um, tribe... They're kind of the social elite. If you're not Pashtun, you're nothing. You won't be an officer. You won't mm -hmm. elevate. We watched a Pashtun guy rob someone, and he got slapped. He got punished. We watched a, a guy from the Dari tribe who was in their platoon. He accidentally shot his gun at the berm, uh, negligent discharge. Mm -hmm. The commander took um, rope from an uh, from, uh, HST net from one of those airlifting nets. Mm -hmm. He flayed the ends of it so it was all loose. And he whipped the man while he crawled on the ground for about an hour. I mean, we saw biblical punishments. And there was just, you could see these sort of things are prejudice. There's no equality there. There's no system to it. They're, oh, he needs to be punished. Or, I can't punish him. He's a posh dude. It's like, oh, great. So there's so many moving parts. Anthropologists could have a field day on the ground level in Afghanistan because there's so many moving parts and things that we were aware of that were disorganized that you just kind of had to work in and out of. You had obstacles in the way. Oh, training some of these soldiers, you can't train them that well when they're stoned. Mm -hmm. 
and they would sit in rooms and smoke weed. We'd train them, do maps and stuff. There's a wonderful documentary out there. Um, this is what winning looks like in Afghanistan. It's bar none, the best documentary done. A lot of people don't like it because it's very cynical and it shows you the stuff you don't want to see. Mm -hmm. It was filmed exactly where I was the month after I left. Mm -hmm. And that was in the drawdown because the second half of my deployment was withdrawing, right. pulling out of sin again. How much enemy activity was there while you were there? There was quite a bit. Um, the deployment before us was a lot. My first two, three months there, there wasn't a whole lot because they were growing the poppy. And that's how the Taliban finances their, mm -hmm. all their arms and their trade. And the people that would work these fields were either just trying to make money or they were Taliban, migrant workers. They knew it. We knew it. We just couldn't do anything about it because they weren't armed. They weren't attacking us. But when you're sitting in a PV in a world patrol base, surrounded in every direction by poppy, they tend not to shoot rockets at you because they don't want to blow up their fields. And they mm -hmm. know the moment they do that, the, the eradication effort was going on. Mm -hmm. We don't care about their poppy fields, but also the Afghan police... As corrupt as they are, they're supposed to be eradicating these fields. There was a day when they drove a bulldozer into this poppy field. It had been silent for weeks. As soon as that bulldozer touched poppy, firefight. Mm -hmm. what they, and we, they didn't shoot at us. They knew. If you shoot at Marines, they have planes, they have helicopters, they have bigger guns. Mm -hmm. So they only shot at these police, and they were almost strategic in not engaging us and not mm -hmm. being within sight of us. This happened numerous times. They would ambush the police and the army. They wouldn't shoot at us. So in this three first three months is relatively quiet for us, except for the Afghan army and police. Mm -hmm. Would you go to the rescue of the Afghans, or would not they... all the time? Mm -hmm. They had to take the lead. They had to learn how to handle their own fights. Mm -hmm. So it sucked. We wanted to. Oh, we would be sitting in every post, machine guns ready, just waiting. Is all we needed was positive identification. This person is engaging in the army and police. If they're engaging our, our allies, they're obviously the enemy. Mm -hmm. You just have the positive idea, because there's a lot of rules of engagement, which mm -hmm. pretty much tied our hands in 90% of the scenarios. If you could ID them, you can engage. And there was two times we could do that from our patrol base. Mm -hmm. Every other time something happened, it had to be on patrol. And they wouldn't engage us on patrol. They, mm -hmm. they, wouldn't, they would put IDs out there. They would try to bait you into these ambushes. They wouldn't just directly engage you. Being in the green zone, there was a lot of foliage in the way. You had um, wadis. You had farm fields. I mean, poppy. And the, the next season, the rainy season, it's, it's corn. Mm -hmm. And that elevates the temperature inside, but all the ground is mush. You can't go directly to the poppy field easily. You sink. We would work out arrangements with the farmers. A lot of the locals liked us. We, The hearts and minds, we were pushing mm -hmm. that. We met with locals a lot. We were very upfront with them. We had a good relationship. We built good rapport. And one of the first things we said is, or when we walked through a field, a farmer was yelling at us. He said, why are you walking through my field? You're destroying my crops. And we looked at him and we said, because there's bombs on these paths. Mm -hmm. And we said, if you can guarantee no bombs in these paths, we'll walk your path. We won't walk through your field. But if we find one bomb, we are going to walk zigzags through your field. And we had the translator tell him all mm -hmm. these things. And he said, okay. For the next three months, every villager, if there was a bomb out there, they took us to it. They told us exactly where it was. Mm -hmm. If the Taliban even came into the area for an hour, we knew. We had, I guess it would be ground level intelligence, mm -hmm. we had informants everywhere. We actually had informants who would dime out who the Taliban were. They would come and tell us where their weapons caches were. I had a few operations where I had to go seize their mm -hmm. caches. They worked out. Mm -hmm. Did the Taliban retaliate against people in these communities? Some. Some, we did a good job hiding when they would come and talk to the ANA. Unless one of their the Taliban informants identified them, we would put ski masks on their face. So that way when they're walking through the village, mm -hmm. we put them in Afghan or army clothes. That way the locals can say, oh, it's this person. Mm -hmm. They just look like an army soldier with a ski mask. Okay. So we've learned to do some things reasonably effectively then. Some things. So you have the impression that if we had kind of continued to maintain that presence, that might have accomplished something? If we were to maintain that presence, the security side, yeah. The hearts and minds played out. The thing is, as an advisor, and you'll see, you know, the second half of my deployment, you'll see it all go downhill. Mm -hmm. um, it requires a lot of patience and understanding person. Your regular PFC or Lance Corporal is not cut out for that. Most of them are testosterone filled. Mm -hmm. um, they're the lowest level on the totem pole. They're usually pissed off about something or anything. And it's not really reliable to work with another culture 
and today in the United States, everybody, this, this Islamophobia, mm-hmm. it's a thing, mm-hmm. whether people like it or not. And a lot of guys join the Marine Corps not because they want to advise people, they want to kill something. So when you have a Lance Corporal out there who just wants to pick a fight and get into a firefight, he'll find a way. He'll find a way to cause problems. That's not good for the advising your hearts and minds because mm-hmm. they're not patient with it. And so were the people in your unit ones who... There were some. Because, I mean, this was the division project. It was the first time it had done the scale. Usually mm-hmm. before these small teams, the special forces, yeah. small teams, the whole idea of that is it's more higher quality, yeah. less quantity, and it's more selective. We were selective, but only to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. Because you can only control so many variables. You only have so many people. And myself, our squad leaders, we did a good job. Our staff sergeant, not so much, but that was more of a testament to his character and how he was as a person, not his professionality. Mm -hmm. He could do a lot of great things right. Um, My lieutenant, Lieutenant Darlington, he was awesome. He was very patient. I mean, the first conversation with the Afghan commander, the guy asked him when they were going to have sex. Because man love is a thing in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he's, I think he's, I think he's a homophobe. So that was mm-hmm. actually a really funny conversation. We heard about that and we all had a good laugh at him. <laughs> but he took his job very seriously and he worked with these commanders very well. And the reason we squad leaders could work with their sergeants is because we built these relationships. So even mm-hmm. if there was a negative from somebody doing something stupid, generally we had the right relationships to get past that. Mm-hmm. And with the villagers, everything is... You take it with a grain of salt. And half of these people, they don't care. If we're not there, the Taliban is. They just mm-hmm. want to live. They want to raise their yeah. family peacefully. And being the rational individual we are in the room, we can see that. Your regular Lance Corporal who wants to blow something up does not. Mm-hmm. They, if they do see it, frankly, they just might not care. Okay. So would they get into incidents with the Afghans? Or? Yeah. That's, that's what started happening at the end of my our deployment. Um, Alcatraz, about four or five months in, we got the orders, we're, we're demilitarizing this PV. We are pulling mm-hmm. back, we're pulling that thing in. So everything we had done, all the rapport, we built numerous operations, week-long operations, we built up with these African soldiers, we had made a lot of progress. There wasn't many, um, kinetic, there wasn't a very kinetic environment because the Taliban wouldn't didn't have any ground to stand on. Mm-hmm. Every time the Taliban would come into the area, the Navy SEALs were the AO to our south, and MARSOC was to our north. I don't know how they fought them, I don't know what the Taliban was thinking, I'm going to fight somebody. It's not going to be those two. Yeah. But they would. They would only fight with them, which also begs the question, how legitimate were those firefights? Mm-hmm. But the North, th- that would happen. They called it troops in contact, tick. When it, when uh, you're being overwhelmed, when there's outstanding mm-hmm. odds, you call tick, you get all the combat resources. Mm-hmm. Their regional um, commanders, you get all priority on air support, on JDAMs, missile support, everything. They would get that to the North. But it was like a line. As soon as they would cross into RAO, where, where we were effective, you, you would cut it in half or less of all the interaction, even against the um, Taliban on Afghan army mm-hmm. and police. It's like they knew areas they couldn't, couldn't go into. So I like to think we did really well. Mm-hmm. But as soon as they said, hey, you need to cut, we're pulling back, you need to demilitarize PB Watson, which we did. Mm-hmm. We consolidated all forces, Afghan and Marine. Up at the uh, at Fab Alcatraz, about four or five months. At that point, we were doing post rotations. We only had so many Marines to go around, and somebody has to hold up the security. Mm-hmm. And with the Afghan soldiers sitting out there all day during Ramadan in the high heat, they also wanted Marines with them. And it makes sense why have one person stand all the posts, spread it out. Um, we had Marines go on post during the middle of Ramadan, and they would taunt the Afghan soldiers by drinking water. I can't say their name for obvious reasons, yeah. and this was a very sore point for me and for a lot of people that watched us unravel in front of us because we finally had broken through. We built relationships with some of the hardest sergeants that didn't want to trust the military mm-hmm. or the U.S. forces, and then they're taunting these soldiers. They're drinking water in front of them when these people are fasting. It's 120 degrees out or higher, and they're chugging water from them. Any person is going to get pissed off at that, and then as soon as the African soldier tells them no... A fight ensues mm-hmm. because the Marine escalates it and then says that this Afghan soldier tried to kill him. To this time, there had already been a lot of, we call it green on blue incidents, sweeper cells within the Afghan army or police killing Marines. Mm-hmm. We responded to a few of them, some bad ones in the area, and he said it was that. So instantly the whole base goes on, uh, up in arms. The Afghan soldiers here with this Afghan set on his radio, they're grabbing their guns. 
we don't know what's going on, so we have to grab our guns, and there's a standoff. We had to detain soldiers. We had two or three of these from two buddies, two guys that were friends, and they thought this stuff was funny, and it ended up triggering a snowball that would roll downhill and end up with all of our forces leaving mm -hmm. Alcatraz and going to Bob Jackson. In fact, all of Alcatraz got broken down soon after, and they, they um, advanced the timeline because of these incidences. It will, we probably would have stayed to Alcatraz till the end of our deployment, mm -hmm. and the next unit would have handled demilling it, or it would have been a smooth transition. Because of these incidences, Dog Company and my group all had to pull out. They, just, they sped up the timeline. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, other particular incidents or things that go on during the time? Hmm? Do we pause it? Yeah. I really need to pee. I'm oh. so sorry. Okay. I guess as before we kind of move forward to the last stage of the deployment, are there other kind of incidents or things that happened while you were at Watson? Uh, Living with the Army wasn't problematic at Watson because we had a smaller group of guys. And we called it the A-Team. Mm -hmm. We tried to pick our 11 best and put them down there mm -hmm. because that was the more personal relationship. That was the bulk of the operation. So every day you'd have to do four to eight hours of patrols. There'd either be there'd be a man patrol and there'd be a second patrol or it was just the Afghan army. Mm -hmm. As a squad leader, it was my job to plan all of this out, to orchestrate all this sort of stuff. And uh, we would go on patrols every day with these different guys and the only problems we'd get into was when the Afghans were too high. I, mean, I went on a patrol once. We had to do a vehicle checkpoint in the middle of our patrol. Eight hours is pretty hard. It's a lot of time mm -hmm. when you're walking comparatively to other areas, pretty small area, because the river would be the divide. The Hellman River flew right through, right down the middle of our AO, and we called the other side of it Indian country because there was no presence on that side of the river. Mm -hmm. That was Taliban country. The last army division of Af or Afghan army division over there got destroyed. They got killed. And when we eventually went over there, you could see the old skeletons of their trucks and things that were left behind. But anyway, we'd have to fill eight hours in this area, and we'd go on patrol and because of all the poppy fields. When you make poppy, you have to score the bulb, and the sap runs out, mm -hmm. and that's what becomes heroin and opium. Mm -hmm. The Afghans would take their weed that they were smoking while on patrol, and they would rub it in poppy. And feel extra good. Mm -hmm. And there was a day we'd do a vehicle checkpoint, and they were all baked. They were laughing, they were giggling. They were like, if we got into a firefight, I had two or three Marines with me. Because when we go on patrol, you had to have at least 12 people, but only four of them had to actually be NATO forces or mm -hmm. Marines. And we would cook these books, kind of, because we only had so many guys 11 guys. You had to do post, mm -hmm. post had to constantly be going. We wanted to rotate it out so people weren't exhausted all the time. We would kind of count our translator in those numbers. So there was one patrol. It was just me and my corpsman, in case I got shot, mm -hmm. and our translator. Everything else was Afghan army. Two and a half people, we'll say, to the, all their force, they're all their squad. So th that would be a point of contest between the two. Most of the time, we just picked our battles. Mm -hmm. If they could do their job and they did what I asked, I didn't care how high they were. Not much I can really do. They're not going to listen. All right. Um, now, when you were doing these patrols, I mean, did you go in, get into ambushes, or did the IEDs blow up on you, or anything like that? We had more IEDs than anything. We never got ambushed, at least out of PB Watson mm -hmm. area. Um, we would hear radio chatter because we'd have the type of radios they would use, and we would we'd hear what people were observing us. It might have been fate. We might have missed their mm -hmm. ambush point, or they might have ran away for some reason. But we would go on the security patrols, we'd find IEDs, or informants would take us to caches, we'd always find things, mm -hmm. but we'd, nothing ever actually happened out of it. Which was a blessing, but mm -hmm. I mean, it gets kind of boring after a while. A lot of the times when conflict would happen around that patrol base is when the Marines were inside the base, when we weren't out and around. Mm -hmm. If the Afghan soldiers went out on their own, conflict every time. And which was night and day difference, because mm -hmm. the unit before us, the corn was up, because of the time of year it was, Taliban were throwing grenades over the walls on them. But they wouldn't even come near our post. So either we won the right friends or they did not want to come into our area. All right. Um, and anything else from that? 
piece of the tour, or is that kind of the main piece? That um, even under Watson, so what would happen was dog company would have to do operations too, mm -hmm. and we would support them. Whenever they needed an Afghan unit with them, we would tag along. Okay. And that was, was by design. But then they would also do longer operations where Ospreys would come in. We would all mount up on Ospreys, and we would fly to different regions of Helmet Province, closer to Sangin River Valley than most, but they weren't always in Sangin. And we would support other units. I mean, one time we got into a helicopter, the Navy SEALs got on, and we picked up some Army guys on the way, and we all dumped into an area for a week, did some operations, got in the helicopters, and flew out. Mm -hmm. I couldn't point it out on a map. I couldn't even tell you the name. I just know we got on helicopters, we went and did our job, and came back. And we took the Afghans with us, the Afghan Army. So that was one thing we could provide the Afghan Army was the air support. Mm -hmm. That's the big one. And we gave them a ride a lot. They used a lot of our benefits. Okay. Uh, and talk about the translators. Who were they or were they like? So there's different categories of translators. Uh, I believe category one would be a U.S. citizen. Like uh, somebody immigrated. They mm -hmm. speak Pashtun and Dari. They're Afghan heritage. And they decided to be a translator for the military. So they're a contractor, they make mm -hmm. a lot of money. Then the other ones, most of them, mine, were all locals. They were from Kabul. Mm -hmm. And they, they learned English, they wanted to translate, and a lot of them were trying to get their visa. But they had to work 24 months as a translator mm -hmm. to even qualify for the basic standards because of everything in the country. And then they got to get letters of recommendation. It's, it's actually really hard. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unfortunate because these guys are taking two years out of their life. They're not with their families. Their country's already torn to pieces, and they're siding with the U.S. military. They've already picked a side. They're committed. Mm -hmm. And when they, so some of them can't go home to their villages because the whole town knows what they're doing. And if there's a Taliban informant in there or the Taliban control their village, they'll lose their head. Mm -hmm. So you'd have these happy little Afghan guys who want nothing more than to come to the land where the streets are paved with gold, where they can work and raise a family and everything will be fine. They would generally believe in the American dream, and it's mm -hmm. really nice to see that, that that mindset that that legend was out there. But then only one of my translators has gotten his visa since. Seeing the reality and how they're treated afterwards, the government just leaves them out to dry. Mm -hmm. And they would operate with us, everything. Some of them served in the Afghan army prior to being a translator. They would go on patrols, every patrol, night, morning, day. Didn't matter if we were getting blown up, shot at, or nothing. They were there every time. And they were, they were professional. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, some of their languages wasn't the great. Or it wasn't the, some of their language wasn't the greatest. Mm -hmm. The first thing one of my terps said to me was, fuck you. And I looked at him. I said, what? He's trying to understand the concept of sarcasm and mm -hmm. cursing and how that fits into the English language. But he was doing it horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and then, okay, so you, after Watson then, you're, you're up at Alcatraz. All right, and then what are you doing up there? We're still doing the security patrols. We just weren't out of the PB anymore, so we would mm -hmm. leave the brown zone and go right into the green. Mm -hmm. And occasionally we would patrol the backside into the brown zone. But it was the same concept, long patrols, security patrols with the Afghan army, continuous training, um, demilitarizing. A lot of the time was post because the FOB was a lot bigger of a base, and Dog Company figured, oh, now that you have more Marines here, Animal Company can take half the posts. Mm -hmm. So we had 30 Marines covering half the posts on a base, and they had 200 Marines, mm -hmm. which made us pretty bitter, just percentage-wise. But we had to play the cards that were dealt. Okay. Now, you mentioned that you got over in, into the area that had sort of been no man's land or, 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 or Taliban territory. How did that happen, and when in the deployment does that happen? That's about the middle of the deployment. It was one of the air inserts where we rode off sprays over the river, and we inserted. We occupied a complex, which basically we walk up to a farmer and say, we're living here for a few mm -hmm. days. And he says, okay. And we tell him to go somewhere. We give him a piece of paper, and he can redeem that. He can either go to Lash or Leatherneck or to any of the main regional centers, and he can turn that slip in, and he'll get paid accordingly. Mm -hmm. The government does that for them. So it's not just like we're occupying their house and blowing it up and leaving. So there is an incentive for them, and then we occupy with the Afghan military, and we still do our patrols, our mm -hmm. security patrols, but now there's more of an objective. There's certain villages, there's certain towns, there's certain things we're looking for, certain people. And that was more orchestrated, but that when you do that, it's like a sprint, because you're there for a week, and you're pushing the Afghan soldiers to actually get up and do their job mm -hmm. when they want to sleep. And you have to go out and patrol, it's 120 degrees, you only have 
a little bit of food and a, a canteen of water, so you got to make that last while doing all that. And that was actually the exact opposite side of the river. Mm -hmm. So when we're at Alcatraz and Watson, you're kind of walking up a hill. You're in the valley, you're in the green zone, you're going to the brown. When we were doing this in Taliban country, we were on the edge of the brown zone going into the green. Mm -hmm. We were trying to walk far enough south in the brown zone where we could come down south of the Taliban. And that would be a pain because it was just mountains and mm -hmm. fingers. We call them fingers because you have the high point of the mountain but then there'd be valleys in between mm -hmm. each little high point of terrain and you'd have to go down and up, down and up. It was a pain. And we would do operations like that a lot. Mm -hmm. The most kinetic operation I didn't get to go to. We had to have some part remain behind and the rest of my platoon went to Kali Agaz. Navy SEALs, all dog company, animal company, and Charlie, they all oper uh, occupied a, a new fighting space for a week and they had numerous huts. And they'd go, on, they'd go on patrol. They wouldn't even leave the base. They were getting RPG shot at them. And it was the reason they went there was the regional command said, this is the Taliban stronghold. We know they're there. Mm -hmm. We're going for them. They were basically just going and engaging in a massive firefight, a skirmish. We weren't getting any high land out of it. And seven days later, you're pulling out regardless. Mm -hmm. So it was just a seven-day firefight they went to. Make events better, the Taliban knew we were coming mm -hmm. because a week before the operation was supposed to happen, somebody messed up paperwork at Camp Bastion. And they did, a, they did a supply insert. Oh. They dropped MREs and ammo in the middle of Taliban country a week before we showed up. Okay. <clears throat> so that was helpful. You, couldn't, you didn't know every... So we call those like indicators. Mm -hmm. You see an MRE box on the side of the road. Do not touch it. If we didn't put it there, don't touch it. It's probably a booby trap. That stuff happens all the time. They turn mm -hmm. them into bombs. They can get, if you leave with this pen on the street in a 9-volt battery... They'll find fertilizer, and they will make a bomb out of it. And this spring will help make that pressure point. Lovely. Yeah. Nice they, they, give you, they give you hour-long classes on why not to give the local kids pens. Because mm -hmm. over 10 years, we've given them, here, have this pen. You'll learn how to read and write. They want to go to school. They give the Taliban, bomb. <coughs> MacGyver would be jealous. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, in this last stage, as you've kind of pulled out of some of the smaller bases and things, was there a difference in enemy activity, or did they still just stay out of your way? We withdrew from Alcatraz about month, during month five, and we moved on to Fo uh, Fob Jackson mm -hmm. with the rest of our company. All the other FOBs were demilling too. We were just the first one to do it. And all that territory we were in was now Afghan Army. There's mm -hmm. no Marine presence. The only presence up there was the Navy SEALs in their patrol base and MARSOC on the northern edge of the AO. Mm -hmm. And when we pulled back, it was a night and day difference. We had to go up there because MARSOC, they had a green and blue incident. An Afghan police officer walked into their base. It was a more open base because mm -hmm. of the style and structure that they had. Yeah. He walked into their command center and he unloaded his gun and he killed four Marines. So we had to reinforce them for a day so they could take their wounded to the right place, take the dead to the right place and just help them out. Mm -hmm. We drove through our old AO, craters on the sides of the road, spotters, Taliban spotters on every hilltop. They were there. They just weren't engaging us. Mm -hmm. they, they just moved right in as soon as we left. The base that we used to occupy became a Taliban strong point. They um, overran two Afghan, pure Afghan army PBs, got overrun. And that was the first sign of what happens. Mm -hmm. we, we all knew it. Over the next year and a half after that happened, when we fully pulled out of Sangin, the Taliban just took the ground. Mm -hmm. And wherever the army stood, they fought them. And they won. It's depressing when, when we look back at it. It's disheartening yeah. because we were making such gains. We were making leaps mm -hmm. and bounds. And we watched it completely unravel. And my personal experience would be none of that would have happened if we didn't have two Marines decide to pick a fight with two soldiers. Mm -hmm. You think what you do doesn't matter. That's a massive mm -hmm. butterfly effect. Although in the larger scheme of things, it probably happens eventually anyway. It just happened a little bit sooner. And we announced on the news for the whole world to know. Yeah. We're going to pull back. We need to let the Afghans take the lead. But it could have happened under a whole different... You know, you know, a lot of different things could have mm -hmm. happened, logistically, training-wise. Mm -hmm. um, the Afghans didn't want to patrol. They didn't want it. There was a lot of places in saying in Afghans wouldn't leave their base because the Taliban would fight them immediately. Mm -hmm. And unless, unless NATO forces were with them, they didn't stand a chance because they didn't have minesweepers, they didn't have the gear, and the Taliban, frankly, had more heart than they did. Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> uh, now, 
do your living circumstances improve as you go to larger bases? Yes. Day-to-day -day life? I mean, what do you have at Jackson, for instance, that you're not going to have out in the... When I lived at my patrol base, some guys had cots. We had to carry them down there, so that way people weren't sleeping on the hard floor with spiders and scorpions and whatnot. Um, I didn't have a cot. I used a pole litter, which is what you use to carry the wounded out. You can have a pulvis litter, which is like a mm -hmm. soft bag to put somebody in a helicopter, but the pole ones are a little more comfortable. I slept on that in a mud, in a mud room. Mm -hmm. That was the extent of my living area. When I moved to Alcatraz, we actually had full tents. We built floors, elevated off the ground out of wood, took a day to do it, but then we put tents over them. So it was a more organized tent as a structure. It was a company living area. It was a very built-up area. Jackson was like the next step above that. You had these tents. They weren't on wood, but they put HESCO ground barriers around them, so they were like bunkers. And that was the whole base. It was the first position the British, when the British pushed mm -hmm. them to sing in, they built Jackson. So it was the most fortified. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how much communication do you have with people at home while you're out there? We had a satellite phone. As I said, as we the PB, they, they want Marines to have high morale. Mm -hmm. So all the patrol bases got a satellite phone. So we would time out when we would call home. and I, would, I didn't want to call my family every other mm -hmm. day. We actually figured out that the Taliban would shoot at us every time we were on our phone. Because we'd have to go sit on the roof to get the satellite signal. Mm -hmm. And one of our Marines... He would be calling his wife, and the first time she picks up, he goes, hey, it's me. Firefight breaks out, he drops the phone, and she hears the whole thing on the phone. Oh. So she's freaking out back home. And he ends up hanging it up, and he calls her back a half hour later. As soon as he walks on the roof with the antenna, shots shoot at him. And this was one of the rare occasions we actually got shot at, is mm -hmm. because somebody was on the roof with the phone. And it was, so we stopped using the satellite phone as much down, down mm -hmm. there. When you're at Alcatraz and... Um, Jackson, you have internet. Mm -hmm. They call it the MWR. I don't know what it stands for, but it's a room full of computers and slow internet connection, and you can Skype with family and friends, or you can just pick up a phone mm -hmm. and call. But it's shared mm -hmm. among hundreds of people. All right. <coughs> okay. So how long in total were you actually in Afghanistan at that point? Seven months. Okay. Left in, let's see, I got there January, February, March. I got back in October. Okay, it was like 2012 still? Yeah, it's 2012, all okay. through the summer. All right. Uh, and at that point, how much time do you have left in your enlistment? About six to eight months Okay. at that point, because I was supposed to get out in August of 2013. Mm -hmm. But because of budgetary issues, the Marine Corps was offering the voluntary early release. So a lot of us, when we came back, if we wanted to go to school or do something, we would jump on that. Mm -hmm. We would try and sign up, and it was first come, first serve. They wanted to get closer to your, you had to be within a year mm -hmm. of your end of active service to qualify. Okay. Now, as you get, uh, you get, you get the end of the deployment, now what's the process for getting the maps? The whole battalion going to go together, or how does that work? It's companies at a time. Mm -hmm. So small, they'd want to do smaller units at a time and base by base. And so as the new unit comes in, and uh, a new advising unit relieved us, 2-7, mm -hmm. which is in that documentary, it was mm -hmm. 2nd Battalion, 2nd yeah. Marines. Um, they relieved us. You can see everything they've had in that movie. But it's kind of like what, when we got there, just reversed. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to take them out and show them around. And we had some problems because this new unit, they thought they knew everything. They didn't oh. want to listen to us. Okay. We would go out on a vehicle patrol up to Alcatraz mm -hmm. where there had been firefights the day before, craters in the road. We'd stop because a car got or a truck got stuck. And these people who had a little bit of rank would get out of the car and start walking around. And here I am, a corporal, have to look over at an officer and say, hey, get the fuck back in the car. I've been up for two days because I'm doing post rotations because mm -hmm. Animal Company, the only people that stayed behind at month six, 75% of Animal Company got left. They went home. Mm -hmm. And that was just because of how the rotations would work. Mm -hmm. The remain behind element was all the squad leaders in command so we could show the new company. Right. And... Here I am, this corporal in my building. I've been in country seven months. I'm low on sleep and food, and this guy gets out of the truck like he's been there for nine months. I don't want to be picking up his legs. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to get into a firefight because he's an idiot. So I yell at him, and he doesn't want to listen. That was a common occurrence. Eventually, our platoon and our company, animal company, stopped ripping with them. We, mm -hmm. we stopped advising them. We said, look, if you're not going to listen to what our officers say, what our squad leaders say, if you know everything, take it. Have fun. They had casualties. They had three casualties their first month there because mm -hmm. of that. They, they wouldn't 
take advice. So that was a pain, but they would fly you out systematically. So animal company, part leaves, then Baker Company would have some go home, then Charlie Company, and it was just kind of this phase mm -hmm. over the span of weeks where they would fly you to Leatherneck, you'd go back to Bash and Leatherneck, mm -hmm. and then as a matter of time, they'd get a C-130 range, you could be there for a week or two mm -hmm. weeks. I was there for a week and a half waiting for our plane. Mm -hmm. And then we'd fly to Manas, you're in Manas Air Base for few days, maybe a week, you can work out, you can finally drink a beer because mm -hmm. there's beer there for the people going home. Mm -hmm. You can have two beers a day because you haven't drank in seven months. Of course, the Marines see this Russian malt liquor called Batika Number no. 9. It's horrible, but you haven't drank in seven months. So these guys are like, oh, it's 9%, let's drink it. And two beers, they're taking their shirt off in the street. Then they had, they had other beers so too. So it's like decompression. Mm -hmm. It's time just to yeah. relax. That's yeah. the whole point. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you get home, your bus rolls in to 29 Palms after all these long flights and just being in transit and your family and friends are waiting. Now, do they do any kind of um, debriefing or other kinds of things to sort of help you readjust to being back in the States or do they just put oh, you back in the States? That's the bulk of the time going into country is, is briefs about what to expect going into country mm -hmm. operational things. That last week in Leatherneck mm -hmm. is the debriefs. Okay. You get to meet with a chaplain as a platoon or a company and everybody's being told when you get home your domestic apparatus, everything's going to be different. Your wife has been living on her own for seven months or if, if you're married. All of these dynamics have changed. You haven't been there. you got to adjust. Nobody's been with you in deployment. You've grown and changed in seven months. Mm -hmm. So have they. And now you got to bring all that back together. So they do a lot, a lot of counseling and training and briefs and what to expect coming home. And then for information and intelligence, that's continuous the whole mm -hmm. time you're there. Yeah. Now when they're getting all of this stuff, to what extent is anyone paying attention? Half and half. I mean, it's a lot of stuff that nothing profound. Mm -hmm. It's nothing outstanding, but they have to say it. And probably half the Marines listen, but by the end of the last brief, you've been sitting through six or seven of them. You're mm -hmm. like, okay, I get it. Don't punch my wife. Don't drink and drive. What else do you mm -hmm. want me to do? And there's a lot of just animosity, a lot of tension. People are eager to go home. Yeah. They're just sick of being there. So imagine it'd be like college students before summer semester. All right. Uh, so now you get back uh, sort of end of the year. Now, now what do they do with you those last few months while you're still in? We call that the skate period where you just skate by. Um, for everybody that's not about to get out, it's life as usual. Mm -hmm. School, training, rotation, everything's building back up. You got like a three month window while they're reorganizing the battalion. And then for people like me, you're kind of in the cracks. You know you're about to separate, they know you're about to separate. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to waste, they don't want to send you to a school if right. you're just going to get out. So you're just there. You're filling up space and time, or they're trying to get you to re enlist. Mm -hmm. Did they make much of an effort to get you to re enlist? They did. They did. I actually hurt my back. I did the last week in Afghanistan, I started to get hurt, mm -hmm. but it really crippled me when I was back in 29 Palms to the point where I had to walk with a cane and do mm -hmm. physical therapy. Okay. So I was really useless. I couldn't do training events either. So a lot of my time was taken up with the basic administration stuff that needed to be done as a squad mm -hmm. leader. Right. Being put back in dog company, but then also mentoring and training the junior Marines. Because mm -hmm. even though we might haze them and all that, Training is continuous. You mm -hmm. got to bring these guys up to speed. There's always something that can be done mm -hmm. to make them better, and that's what a lot of your attention is to pass on everything you know to them. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so now you get to the end of it. Um, so when do you get out? I got out March or April of 2013. Okay. Uh, and what do you do once you're out? I drove to San Francisco for a week. I wanted to see San Francisco and everybody up there, so I drove the highway north to California. I got there for a few days and then picked up my mom in Reno. She flew to Reno, mm -hmm. got out of the, got off the plane to get into my car to drive back across the country wow. all the way to Michigan. But I did the cross country road trip. All right. Uh, and now, by this time, had you figured out what you wanted to do? I knew I wanted to go to school. I'd applied to Grand Valley, mm -hmm. been accepted. Michigan State didn't even send me a denial letter. They just took my money and ignored me, for the record. Michigan State. Mm -hmm. And, uh, at that point, I knew I was going to start at the fall term for Grand mm -hmm. Valley, but I had the whole summer ahead of me. So I was just kind of in limbo. I stayed with my parents for a little bit, um, worked out and end jobs, got to see family and friends I hadn't seen in a long time. I had basically two or three months. I'd saved up a lot. Mm -hmm. Marines don't save money. Mm -hmm. 
but I had saved up money as well. I was able to get by mm -hmm. the summer and then start school and the GI Bill would kick in. Okay. Did you have any problems just adjusting to being a civilian again? I didn't. I mean, I had a lot of decompression time after Afghanistan. I had mm -hmm. six or seven months. Yeah. And a kind of a limbo period to prepare. Mm -hmm. um, it was weird. I mean, there was a lot of tension with family and friends, people you hadn't seen in a while, people that had grown apart or changed. But none of that, I'd say, was because of the military. Mm -hmm. I mean, now these days, you got guys getting out, and the hot topic is PTSD. Mm -hmm. But how much of it's actually PTSD, and how much of it was they were socially awkward before they went in, and now they got out, and they mm -hmm. blame it on PTSD. That's a problem that nobody wants to talk about. I believe in uh, post-traumatic growth. It's this theory out there that post-traumatic stress disorder, these traumatic experiences can cause a breakdown, a lot of mm -hmm. problems. How many of these experiences, though, can cause growth? Mm -hmm. Kind of like throwing someone in the fire, see what happens. I know for a fact I am night and day different than I was when I was 21, and that was after Afghanistan. So how did that affect you, if you want to explain anything, that? It made me, it made me more organized, because when I left the Marine Corps, not just the Afghanistan deployment, but the Marine Corps in general, the four years, mm -hmm. I learned organization, I learned leadership abilities, things that you can't really teach people in a classroom. Mm -hmm. It's hands-on experience, trial and error. God, I messed up so many times, it wrapped my head around to this day, mm -hmm. how am I here? But the thing is, all that added up, so when I got out, I had an idea of what you had to do to get by. I had an idea of time management, organizational mm -hmm. skills, how to lead people, but also how to follow. There's, there's always enough chiefs. Sometimes you need to have an Indian in the group. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to interact with people in that way in a professional setting. All that would transit over in the professional world. Mm -hmm. Civilian day-to-day -day life, I don't really know how to, if you can't teach, if a person doesn't know how to function as an adult, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to show them because there's something missing there. Yeah. And a lot of these kids, they go into the military, they're 17, 18, maybe 19. So a lot are older and that is a whole other, that's I guess an outlier. Mm -hmm. But for your average, those young kids, when they go to the military, they're trying to learn how to be a person and an adult. Mm -hmm. And that's conflicting with what's happening because they're training you to be a Marine. They're trying right. to do, some people accept it, some people fight it, some people, you see the movies of people with PTSD. Mm -hmm. They get out, they have problems, they shoot their wife, they commit suicide. There's a large suicide problem, a rampant suicide problem mm -hmm. with, with the military community. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever talks about the guys that get out of the service and go on and do regular things because mm -hmm. nobody wants to talk about it. And then eat a lot of them exhibit aspects of PTSD still go and like have regular lives too. Yeah. Yeah. There's all a wide, wide, wide range of things. There's, I mean, you look back to World War II, Korea, Vietnam probably had the worst shell shocks, what they were calling it back then, and PTSD. These guys get out, and some of them, they don't sleep, they have insomnia. They, they have to do these ritualistic things. I know a man, he has to get up every night and he has to walk around his yard at like 2 a.m. to make sure his house is secure. He has to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's PTSD to the extreme, it's not the worst thing that could happen. Mm -hmm. But then you have guys that get out and they can't get a job, their plan falls apart, and then they blame the PTSD. Oh, I don't have the professional skills. No, it's not PTSD. You're just an idiot. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's just a very wide range of reactions that people have and a lot of things that happen uh, for you. Uh, now, uh, what are you studying here? I studied international relations. Um, I have a minor in international business. I studied abroad for a year in Poland in their, uh, the STAIR program. Mm -hmm. So it's an international business dual degree through Krakow University of Economics. Mm -hmm. um, what do you want to do with it? I'm actually looking to go into supply chain, work in the business side. I'm sick of the government side. <laughs> Frankly, I'm sick of international relations at this point because a lot of it doesn't change unless you're one of the policy makers. It's yours to call it a machine. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I tell you, you, you got a good story. You present it very effectively. So I'd just like to close this up by thanking you for taking the time to do that today. No problem. If you have any questions, let me know. All right. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah.